Welcome to the 2023 NORED program. I'm Silvio Baldessera, Chair Emeritus of NOR, founder of NORED, and your host. NORED is a continuing education program founded 16 years ago with three main goals, to teach, learn, improve, and to do that continuously. The program relies on bringing the best guest speakers in three series, architecture, engineering, and masters. Each of the NORED virtual sessions since 2020 have been recorded and are available on NORED YouTube for global access. Welcome to the 14 NOR offices and invited guests. Welcome also to the students from the 16 schools of architecture in Canada, the USA, the UK, and Europe. On April the 12th, 2019, a small group of notable academics and architects stood outside IIT's College of Architecture to start the Platform Middle Symposium. In a few days on September the 25th, 546 Architecture from Winnipeg will launch their book, Platform Middle Architecture. In our NORAD today, we are fortunate to hear from the author of the book, followed by a panel discussion. The background to the book is founded in the symposium, and I quote from the opening text of the book, the housing affordability crisis in North America has reached a crisis point. We need solutions for city building that are more socially economically sustainable, as well as multifamily housing that is more equitable and livable. The book focuses on many forms of ownership models from refugee and social housing to market rate condominiums inspired by discussions of the symposium. The four volume publication expands on practice, research, working with challenging and economic environmental circumstances. The four volumes represents a toolkit for high quality, attainable, accessible and affordable multifamily housing, end of quote. 546 architecture has provided architects, developers, planners, policy makers, a complete, as they say, toolkit with real solutions. Today, you will be one of the first to hear what some of those are from the co-author, Johanna Herme. Johanna Herme is an architect and co-founder of Winnipeg-based design studio 5468796 Architecture. The firm has been awarded numerous international recognitions, including 50 best architectural firms in 2020 by Domus, Rice Design Alliance Spotlight Award, the RAIC Emerging Architecture, Practice Award, WAN 21 for 21, Architecture League, NY Emerging Voices, the Design Vanguard issue of Architectural Record, and was Canada's official representation in the 2012 Venice Biennale in Architecture. 5468796 is led by uh, Herme uh, with Colin Neufeld and Sasha Radovich. In addition to practice, Johanna is an activist, advocate, and educator, having initiated and co-created a number of design-related events and programs, including the 2013 Professional Prix de Rome uh, prize-winning project, Table for 12 Plus 1200, she is past chair of the Winnipeg Chamber of Commerce, currently the executive board of the RAIC, Architecture Canada, and a member of the International Council of the New York-based Van Allen Institute. In 2019, she was named visiting Professor Morganson Chair at the College of Architecture, Illinois Institute of Technology, 
And most recently, she was invited to Cornell AAP at the Gensler Visiting Critic. She has also taught design at several Canadian universities and lectures extensively across the world. Johanna contributed to innovative solutions for creating sustainable cities, edited by Sylvie Albert in 2019 and is co-author of the platform, Middle Architecture for Housing, the 99% being launched September the 25th, 2023. Welcome, Johanna Hermey. Thank you so much, Silvio. Thank you for the kind introduction. It's my uh, great pleasure and honor to, to be here and take part in this session. And I'm, I'm really excited uh, to talk about this publication for the first time. Um, of course, uh, we will be talking about some of our work, but I will explain um, that all uh, coming up. Um, and you already covered how this came about. So I'll just say a few words about our office before we get going. Um, so Sasha and I uh, started in 2007 with this idea that uh, we wanted to fight ambivalence about architecture and, and what that meant for our city that was quite sort of uh, unaware what architecture can do, what its, uh, what its powers really are. And we hope that somehow we could we could stir something uh, uh, in the in the mix. And then Colin joined us uh, within the first year. So the three uh, three of us have been together for um, for sixteen years now. And the office is about twenty people, and we work around a single table all together, uh, and hope to value ideas that come from around that table more so than than who the who the author of them is specifically. Then early on, we got into multi-family housing, multi housing projects uh, quite some dip serendipitously. Um, so it was sort of, we say that the, the work got to shape us before we had a chance to shape it. Uh, we, got, uh, we got familiar with private development and, and understanding uh, poor forma scenarios quite intimately in those early years. And, and that's really Kind of given us the background um, where this book is coming from and where the publication is coming from and what we hope to do with it. And um, as you can see, this is not all of it, but uh, a lot of uh, units have been designed and built since we since we got started. And and all of that together is is um, is shaping our understanding of of what we're dealing with uh, when it comes to the housing crisis. And of course, um, as Sylvia mentioned, all, um, the book is a four part series, uh, starting with the uh, really the contents of the symposium that was held in 2019. And then um, we also recognize that there are a number of uh, parts of the equation really that architects don't really have a say in, uh, not specifically and not entirely. And those sorts of things include the political climate, um, the economies, that are at play, um, the um, zoning and policy, political environment that we all operate in, uh, regulation and, and so forth. And so we discussed some of those challenges in the, in the macro book. And then um, micro and modeling really go together. Modeling is really a catalog of the projects that we've done to date, uh, where we can pick out some of those lessons that uh, I will be discussing today. And then, uh, a micro is going into that detail um, on explaining uh, what those strategies could be, where architects actually have a say, where we could affect the outcome, where we can carve from a very tight formula, a little bit of room for, for architecture. And really at end goal being that uh, the end user will hopefully benefit from this. Um, I wanna give recognition to the participants of the symposium um, instigated by um, then interim Dean Mike Michelangelo Sabatino and then uh, various developers, academics um, and architects from around the two countries across North America. Um, so thank you all for your contributions and, and really putting the seed into our minds. But what we really are focusing on is, is sort of that, uh, that toolkit and then uh, what we call a practice ecosystem that we think is sort of a necessary part of, of uh, what we do uh, when it comes to more specifics um, on the housing. So the um, reason we call this the ecosystem is that we sort of believe that architects role is much wider today than, uh, than we perhaps 
recognized directly under what is in our jurisdiction and what we are commissioned to do on various uh, various jobs and 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 commissions. Um, and so we really have to intersect with politics, economics, civic government, uh, and other forms of cultural and scholarly uh, research to be able to get where we need to get to, uh, it, to fulfill our responsibility, we think, and fulfill our role uh, in that equation. And so um, in our practice, what that means is that in, in addition to just general practice and the traditional practice of architecture, uh, we, as many others do, uh, participate in design competitions, juries, awards, um, you know, all of those things that uh, publications to try to further what we what we do. But there are also other parts of it that are really, um, I, I guess, really integral to uh, kind of 546's DNA that we think are necessary for us to be as as um, you know, active as and as knowledgeable and as 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 be able to operate from the uh, from creating value in architecture otherwise, and and be able to have a say and be able to invite it to the table to have discussions about what could make the future better um, for that big portion of our population. And so these include uh, design activism projects. Uh, my partners always call these the Lose Your Shirt projects. Um, so mostly uh, headed by myself, I'm very passionate about this stuff, but um, uh, you know, they're little initiatives that any student out there could also uh, start um, little projects that um, have sometimes spawn into uh, multi-year uh, events like the Table for 12 and 1200, um or um or sort of the uh duplication of of our original one bucket at the time in mexico city installation to becoming a sort of a fundraiser for an orphanage uh at the design festival in winnipeg and, and things like that so um there's a lot of that we also do exhibitions of the work uh, and again i'm not intending to talk about this very much so i'm going very uh quickly here um, that include the Venice Biennale previously mentioned uh, that toured nine cities and actually was one of our panelists, Jay Sung Chong, uh, was our co-creator, uh, co-curator um, of that project. So I just want to make sure that um, everybody knows that. We've been trying to write about what we think is important, both of the city scale and level uh, when it comes to city planning and, um, and what are the smart things that our city here in Winnipeg should do uh, when it comes to um, its footprint, uh, how to plan better, what the future should really look like if we actually look at from it from the economy's uh, perspective, perspective. And I had a great platform um, for that uh, while while chairing the Winnipeg Chamber of Commerce. I did a food for thought series. So this is on the political realm. Um, try to influence, uh, you know, thousand uh, business people and um, decision makers, politicians in the room every month uh, for, for a full year with these little info slides that were really based on numbers and on your ROI and, and what you can get back if you if you plan the city better, uh, including uh, procurement task force that I headed and things like uh, mayoral debates or any political discussions that are, that are out there when the elections come up. We wanna be um, there to call on and hold accountable our, our decision makers and politicians who are running for office and I want to be asked uh, what it is that we should be doing. So that's part of the community service that we're trying to do alongside of the actual housing projects. We, of course, teach like many of you out there do as well. And uh, but I think maybe what one thing worth mentioning there that might be a bit more unique is that we've been asking our students also to do performance, to understand what costs really are uh, to projects and, and how you can maneuver in that very tight margin again, where the architecture can be found and how, how you can improve quality. But in order for you to do that, you have to understand first, uh, what are the basic requirements that um, a developer um, um, you know, or a nonprofit organization would have. And then, of course, competitions that uh, we test ourselves uh, against our peers around the world uh, form an important part of that sort of anecdotal research on, on what's out there, uh, what works, what doesn't work, where you can really be free. Um, we also do what we call design giving, which is, you know, these little in, um, insertions into the city. Um, in this case, one of our projects that became sort of a guest pad 
um, up on top of it or a little um, pop-up kiosk uh, in our exchange district, historic exchange district here that can be utilized by a number of organizations, most recently um, the Winnipeg um, Exchange District Biz um, that's been running it and also Design Quarter that um, I co-founded and, and started in 2017. Design, design juries, publications, as mentioned, also important part of that DNA, the ecosystem that we operate in. And then finally, uh, collaborations that uh, we around that table not only um, fairly intimately share details of our, our ongoing project work, but also invite others to take part in it. We've hosted the Winnipeg Architecture Foundation for 12 years. They've just departed um, to go to the uh, to, to stay with MAA that have more exhibition space. But regardless, um, that was a really, really uh, great collaboration for many years. Uh, Design Quarter Winnipeg parked their uh, ED in our office. Um, similarly, the um, uh, storefront Manitoba, when it was in transition, um, had a chair in, at the desk for a while and um, many developers along the way as well. And we think that this sort of learning through osmosis, learning through sharing, learning through almost like as a water cooler um, discussion is really important in the way that uh, we learn to think and in the way that we learn to appreciate uh, other perspectives. So on to then the, uh, the main bulk of the discussion today, um, really on housing. Um, so 546 has really involved itself with, with housing for this past a decade and a half. And um, it's anywhere from, of course, from a single family homes that we've done some, uh, but that is for the 1% typically, uh, but really that the focus has been on the, on the middle part uh, where it's, you know, from small complexes, you know, seven units or something up to um, 200 plus um, or even 700 plus that are on the boards right now. And so really trying to focus on uh, what we think is missing from the cities across, uh, across North America, um, especially in the Midwest, where we generally have you know, majority of our, our, our population lives in single family homes, um, the other half, perhaps in sort of big apartment blocks, and then the middle part is, is, is vastly underrepresented. And we think there are qualities there, there are things that make the cities better overall, better places to live, better places for people, um, better places for altered modes of transportation, and so forth. So that's a whole um, discussion on its own, but some some basics here to share from the book. Um, so the average North American occupies four times more square area than than an average Asian does, and twice as much as a, as a European does. And Sasha and I, coming from Europe, this is sort of very intimately built into ourselves. So just to sort of awe at how much space we really get to enjoy in in uh, North America. But at the same time, of course, it comes with the uh, sort of uh, environmental responsibility um, that we really can't afford to do this for much longer. And what are the solutions to that? Uh, second issue that's really uh, creating the crisis that we have on our hands is, uh, is the um, commodification of housing. And that means that housing is not seen as a, as a right or not seen as a social good, but seen as a uh, financial instrument and, and a vehicle for investment. Um, as of 2020, the value of global real estate is approximately 270 trillion US dollars and rising, and residential is 75% of that total. And so it's a scary, uh, scary thing when you think about uh, that, and, and we know the results of that coming out of Vancouver and coming uh, out of lots of parts of of the, the eastern part of our country and, and certainly feeling some of those effects, not as extreme, but um, some of those effects here in the Midwest as well. Um, buildings are responsible for a hu huge amount of uh, greenhouse gases and emissions. And um, of course, this is where we have to think about what are some of the ways that we could add quality to living that doesn't require the space that we that we uh, previously had. And, and the environment is sort of in that in, in the background for there as always, when we're trying to convince people that look, living in an apartment setting, living in a small scale, uh, you know, setting where you have still access to ground and ground oriented development is actually 
um, something that you could do for a life. And it isn't just student housing, it isn't just senior housing, but it could be for families. It could be something that, you know, I used to, I grew up in, Sasha grew up in, and we sort of feel like we maybe turned out okay. Um, in any case, um, but there's also another side of this, which is um, one in 10 Canadians uh, and Canadian households live in core housing need. Um, and 30% uh, of the US households are cost burdened. And so what we often don't think about, even with the current investment, current thinking, all of the hype that's gone around in the media about um, housing and affordability of housing, is that is that bottom 10% or 12% uh, here in Winnipeg that um, people who cannot even afford the so-called affordable suites. And um, just a few more stats here locally, um, you know, almost 20% of Winnipeg households or 40,000, um, or sorry, 63,000 households spends more than 30% of their gross income, which is the measurement of affordability on housing. Um, and but for renters, that percentage is, is much, much higher, 35.7%. And so when we think about what kind of housing we should build and, and where the architect's responsibility lies, that's a really important factor to keep in mind. And again, slightly higher percentage for Winnipeggers uh, when it comes to the core housing need, meaning that you cannot move out of uh, your household and afford um, uh, adequate housing. Um, so there's 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 an official definition that that's pretty much um, close to, to close to accurate. And then uh, disproportionately, single parent households, recent immigrants, and indigenous families um, are in this core housing need. So those are the folks that we really have to think about when we think about affordable programs. When we think about the exhilarator fund that the federal government has just um, uh, beginning to to announce and 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 hand out. Um, and then, you know, a stat that really drove us uh, for a lot of this book, and I think the percentage is actually less than less than this now, but only three and a half percent of Canadian households out of the total, oh, sorry, um, out of the total stock of housing, three percent, three and a half percent of the total housing stock is public housing. Whereas when we compare that to the Netherlands, we compare that to Denmark, we compare that to any sort of Northern European um uh, country, uh, those those percentages hover in the in the sort of thirty so percent, and so we really can't expect to solve the housing crisis in this country in this continent if we don't pay pay attention to this this number, and so to rely on the private sector to do it alone is is not going to be feasible, in my opinion. Um, so when we look at the CMHC. Um, affordable housing programs that have been operating for a few few years now and we know a lot of the developers that we've worked with have tapped into this program what's really tricky about this is that um what they what it considers affordable rate is eleven hundred dollars a month um plus utilities um so that means that uh about a quarter for example of winnipeg households can't afford what's considered affordable household. And I believe that, of course, is much, much higher um, on the coasts. Um, but uh, but the, the, the sad reality is that when we're when we're talking about affordable, it still leaves a quarter of the population out. It's also a big issue is that most of these uh, most of these programs have an expiry dates and and they're typically 10 to 15 years. The L MLI uh, program that's 10 year expiry date. So what that actually means is that the public investment that our, we're currently paying in our tax dollars to um, to the developer is eventually going to end up in their pocket. It is end up benefiting the developer as opposed to the end user. Um, and so that's also a big issue in the way the, um, the programs are set up. So when we think about back to our history where we started, uh, quickly we learned uh, from even the first developer that we worked with that 85% efficiency ratio is where we need to be when it comes to any housing so that they also can uh, deliver profit and, and profit is what obviously drives this, uh, this market and drives this economy. And so, um, 
And what that essentially means that uh, we end up with really deep units that are double loaded and anything anything better from the perspective of the of that quality is going to rise costs and it's not only going to make the project unfeasible but it's also obviously going to um um make it so that um the units don't even really uh come to market and so everything uh, everything in the scenario is is producing housing that is at least 60 uh, feet deep uh, typically, uh, also to match parking below of in, in, in many scenario scenarios and creating suites that uh, either have landlocked bedrooms or um, otherwise are compromised in their width of the living space that can meet the perimeter. Um, and what the book is trying to show you are ways that we could combat that. Some tricks of the trade, nothing really mind blowing, but but something that when we put it together and we know what those tools are, we can hopefully uh, give that um, give those lessons to somebody who's starting out, uh, help someone who's getting into housing architecture for the first time, and really prepare them to hit the ground running. And so that's really our our hope. And then of course. All of that should be combined with some type of uh, ambitious architectural agenda. That's always been our goal, um, but of course, there's others to to judge whether we've we've gotten there. And in my sort of summary, I discussed the idea that it is really a three part tight scenario that sets us uh, in a in a pretty bad path when it comes to the North American housing production. And that is the fact that, uh, as I mentioned, everything is driven by profit. Um, again, that vast majority, 96.5% uh, of the housing stock driven by profit. Uh, we have the two exit, uh, fire exit requirement here compared to our European counterparts, um, which really creates a form that we follow um, as architects and um, and doesn't, doesn't provide cross ventilation for the suites and the end user. And then lastly, we really don't have any sort of codes that or regulations that would dictate otherwise. Uh, for example, um, in Sydney, Australia, um, they have a flat uh, flat design code that requires a certain amount of sunlight to reach the back of the, uh, uh, the housing suite and so forth that it really is in the law. Um, how deep suites could be and how you have to design them to ensure end quality. And, and Canadian uh, jurisdictions, to my knowledge, don't have anything like this. And so we are we are sort of, we're starting from a very bad spot uh, to try to create quality, try to convince families and uh, you know, our, all of our residents really that this could be a lifelong uh, aging place kind of solution for, for living in the long term. And of course, what we also have um, in the toolkit, uh, not necessarily directly in architect's uh, disposal, but we have options for zoning where we require, uh, we have up zoning strategies. Again, Winnipeg has very little of this, but I'm aware of, of course, other cities uh, across the country that do. And, um, you know, some are successful, some less so, but up zoning, inclusionary zoning, soft density, that you know can be deployed to um, um, to increase at least densities in cities, increase the um, stock of housing that we have available. But of course, that doesn't answer necessarily um, the affordability. Um, Inclusion zoning is trying to create affordable suites within uh, uh, within a larger project and and get those on the market. But again, oftentimes. It's up to the programs to decide what the affordability rate is, uh, leaving a big chunk of Canadians out of that equation. So um, what we've done um, then in the publication is to uh, try to use our own work as a, as a lens uh, towards what those tricks of the trade could be, what could be in the architect's toolkit um, to deploy on various scenarios to create better costing scenario, but also add quality at the same time. And so what I'm going to do today is I'm going to walk us through uh, four different projects and try to point some of those out. Uh, the book itself covers uh, 26 projects, I believe, and, and quite a long list of um, options and scenarios um, that could be beneficial. Here's sort of the full list of them. Uh, 
of of what we think are are quality producing uh and and um outcomes and and how they sit and appear in various uh projects um in the book and uh in this presentation uh we'll see coming up and of course just a reminder that none of this is really uh groundbreaking or really sort of magical or anything but it's really trying to put the sort of relatively rudimentary um options uh on the table for us to consider and uh, as a profession to be able to use going forward um and the projects i've chosen today are the 62m housing um the pump house uh the parkade of the future is the official name and 90 to 100 alexander street that's just um ready for almost ready for occupancy so we'll start with the oldest one, um, the 62M housing. Um, again, in the book, it touches on, on ideas of uh, critical opportunism, uh, which is something that um, as a concept that we, um, we think architects can tap into, the idea that you can go out there and create your own projects, create your own opportunities um, by finding the right clients, connecting them with the right um, um public uh, funding entities or or uh, great tenants or um, any sort of various things that uh, build a robust project and then adaptability, um, how it can be adapted um, and be resilient project uh, looking in the future. So I'll try to remember as we go through the, uh, to mention all of these items, but you can see sort of the menu of things, what this project in our minds touches uh, anywhere from uh, how the roofs and, and passages and stairs are treated to how lifting this project up made it possible to the structural alignment uh, of components to unit flexibility to um, uh, dealing with deep units in particular as an issue. This one uh, mobilizing the display plan idea. Um, it's also have an exterior passageway. Um, it's built on the idea of modularity and, and how we create variation from that modularity and then um, tapping into local knowledge and custom fabrication and assembly. So um, the project is really in uh, at the foot of a, um, a freeway, um, as Winnipeg doesn't have many, but this particular one uh, does have a freeway on, the, on its foot. And it doesn't really have a... Um, street presence at all. There's no street uh, facade or street um, access. Um, it's sort of a pack lane scenario. And the developer originally came to us uh, asking if we could make housing feasible in this location. It's the back of an industrial shed. This is a transitional area. Those little boxes that you see in the front is a, is a previous project of ours uh, with the same developer. But um, really the rest is, is largely industrial sheds that um, have very little openings and, and windows to them and then this freeway on the one side. So very quickly, um, as we started working with it, um, we realized we had to lift it up. Um, and I guess the slide is just reminding me, but that typically what we do though, is we look at everything through numbers. And uh, in this case, uh, and with every housing project really that we have, you'll be able to see uh, for our benefit and for your benefit in the in the book too, uh, you know, what the density is, uh, what is the uh, what is the efficiency ratio, what is um, what is the cost, uh, what kind of building materials. And so we're trying to make this sort of very comparable. And again, 41 units in the end, um, 153 bucks a square foot or so at the time. Um, this was completed a couple of years back. Um, and then uh, really a mix of materials, which we'll, which we'll see in a moment uh, for various reasons that I will, I will talk about a little bit more. But um, again, sort of a fairly hostile, uh, unfriendly, uh, place as a Winnipeg can be in the winter time it also was in a sense of where this location where this project is located it's certainly not a walkable neighborhood um, that's a little further away from the site uh, close to an underpass here um, the highway uh, freeway goes up on the side of it and then the industrial sheds that you can see around the area so we 
we knew that we had to lift it up. Um, it's 30 feet up in the air to be able to overcome the looking at the blank walls of the projects around it, being able to lift it up above the freeway and so forth. And then uh, we also knew that we had to pay for that. And so some of the tests here, trying to find out what the right uh, geometry would be to save the most money that we now spend on, on building this pie in the sky, so to speak. And, and fairly quickly realized that um, it is really a round shape. So the round shape is not coming from any sort of idea by, about, about an iconic building, uh, but rather it's sort of this idea that that saves you 30% um, of the envelope and, and you can get 30% more perimeter um, in, in this shape. And so, um, it's, it, it is a result of the being landlocked. It's a result of being in a sort of industrial, a leftover piece of land. And, um, and then the project consists of two levels of, of 20, uh, units. And then a little later on, I'll talk about the, the top little piece there, that guest suite that we showed you, um, a little earlier on. But, um, and then bark, parking um, in Winnipeg is really uh, too expensive to build underground if you're trying to achieve any sort of affordable numbers. And so we knew from the get-go that um, the parking had to be on the surface and um, that is located under the building, um, 42, I think, stalls to the 41 units total. And sort of the outcome there. Um, uh, the developer is still looking at uh, perhaps doing some landscaping, but um, we also are um, planning to yet build a um, rooftop um, running track on the top and little little spots for um, barbecues and so forth on the on the high roof. I think during the pandemic, it became really clear that uh, that maybe you know, not having indoor um, indoor passageways was actually a benefit. People felt less unsafe uh, sharing that those hallways when the fresh air was moving about. And um, again, it wasn't, uh, we wouldn't know anything about the pandemic at the time. This was really a cost saving measure at the time. Um, so we have little um, exterior passageways that lead you to the suites on both levels. You come up in the core um, of the building uh, via an elevator or exit stairs and then get into the suites um, through the exit corridor or exterior corridor. And of course, yes, it's Winnipeg, but it's possible to also here um, to make this feasible. I have a little video that just gives you a sense of uh, walking through there uh, paired with some images. And so we'll see how my timing here works. And the building is really trying to take its cue from the kind of robust industrial um, surroundings that it sits in. Um, putting out materials like concrete on the on the um, on the piers that it sits on, and the central core um, that the exit stairs and the elevator are located in, and then you pop out to those um, precast um, passageway. Um, platforms. Um, sorry, the slides are only moving so fast. So coming back to the uh, the idea, so then uh, we actually do have an opportunity to have a bit of cross ventilation to the door. We also are trying to use the shape to our best of our ability to, and to create something out of an almost 40 foot deep unit. And so it's pretty simple here. The utilities are uh, towards the back where the entry door is. And, and then towards the window in a 600, I think it's 609 square feet total per suite. Uh, we have 22 feet of glass on the front. And these are simple max of fiberglass windows that extend from floor to ceiling, give you a really a panoramic view uh, to the rest of the city. Um, and then um, the way that that is organized is we have two unit types. One is sort of a more upgrade version where we have all the utilities in a, in a three foot bank on one side, opening kind of like a Swiss army, army knife and more traditional layout with, uh, with a typical um, five by eight bathroom uh, 
laundry and utility closet and kitchen and then sort of a sliding door scenario with the with the sleeping area and a, and a living area next to it that can expand when the Murphy bed goes up. And I have a couple of videos here just walking through. This is Ken, a fellow from the office, uh, our associate who shot the videos. He used to live here with his young family at the time and just sort of showing you the more traditional suite that, um, um, that you can see here. Sorry, trying to liven up this a little bit, but I guess the video did not turn around. Um, and then we'll take a look at the other one. Uh, I believe that's the sort of idea of the utility bank on one side, the kind of light that you gain, the flexibility that uh, one is able to get from the sliding things in and out of that, um, that utility bank um, with the floating tub in the center and the kitchen wall that folds over to create some privacy in there. And then a Murphy bed again um, to claim sleeping space um, when you don't, um, when you want the, um, when you want to put the bed away, then uh, claiming that bag as living space um, being the idea here. Bunch of sliding pantries and things to house your clothing and uh, pieces, but this is really trying to um, show what an sort of an open space can can give um, back as a as a place to sort of claim it yourself and and use it the way that you want. The other um, thing about the flex sort of the modularity of of the suites that we had, you know. We had flipped the units um, from one level to another to try to create a more interesting facade, but yet um, keep consistency when it comes to plumbing, plumbing runs and so forth. And so we have uh, a facade that um, is varied and, and there are these fins that cover up uh, mechanical uh, units that are right on the on the facade. And um, and yet the plumbing lines up from one level to the other, even though the even though the units are flipped from one level to the other. And of course, the uh, uh, the construction materials, like I said, it's a hybrid. There is concrete where we needed to there to be concrete. And from an affordability perspective, uh, we tried to convince the builder, local builder here, that once we have a new ground plane on the uh, up in the air, um, then really it's simple construction from there on and it's wood framed um, from that pancake up for two levels. Um, it was also prefabricated in the in the shop uh, as elements. Those elements were brought to site and tilted up. Um, and then of course, you know, Winnipeg, in Winnipeg, we don't, um, and, and many parts of uh, the, the country, we can't afford anything curved, uh, never mind curved glass. These are all um, all pieces that are coming straight from uh, suppliers um, as is. So the fiberglass windows obviously faceted to the uh, to the um, round uh, shape, um, but at the same time creating uh, break shaped fins that mask that roundness and create a bit of more of a shadow line. Um, on the facade. So here's a whole sort of system with Cortan um, facing um, on the uh, behind and then uh, those break shape um, pre-painted fins, uh, metal fins on the on the top. And we dropped the floor um, so that the electrical baseboards are sitting, you know, you can see sort of in number two there, sitting below the floor. So what you really get is a clear view. Um, here's the play on the study on the facade that can, you know, creates a nice variation, um, trying to mask the um, utility and the typical kind of a banal outcome that you get from stacking suites, which is a smart thing to do from a cost and affordability perspective. But yet in this case, like I said, the plumbing uh, walls or plumbing locations still line up, even though the units are, are flipped. Um, and there is sort of a better view of the Cortan and the and the fin combination on the facade. Then at the end of the project, um, let me just see, get this going. Uh, the uh, developer in this case was, uh, you know, uh, owing us a bunch of money um, on fees, as sometimes happens. Um, 
and uh, and then we negotiated for him to give us air rights to the uh, to the top of the exit um, stair and elevator core, and uh, we were able to build a little four hundred square foot um, footprint on the top and a little bit of utility space here at the bottom that you just saw us go by, um, and create this uh, this design suite on the top that for guests that would come to Winnipeg, uh, uh, artists that we could host uh, when they visit. Um, and um, for the rest of the time, um, we're renting it out on, on just short-term rental to pay for the bills, but to be able to sort of give that to visitors and, um, and others um, who we feel should see Winnipeg a different way. Um, that's the sort of an outcome. So that's maybe too much on on this this topic, but um, sort of a little point of interest in the project. And then it sort of nestles there in the in the sort of relatively rough surrounding, as you can see, um, before the downtown core over some uh, railway bridges and so forth. The second project that I thought I would share um, is Pump House. Um, this is a adaptive reuse project of an existing um, pumping station and uh, 93 units, uh, residential units flanking it. Um, again, the things that we'll touch on here, courtyards, plazas, passages and stairs, uh, skip stop corridor, uh, exterior passageways as, as previously, and then custom fabrication and assembly um, ideas. And so again, looking at it in numbers, um, what we have, as I mentioned, 93 units. We have some parking stalls that are for the commercial space um, in phase two um, of the residential portion. Um, and then um, we have a mix of commercial, we have a restaurant, there's a barber shop, there's, um, and then there's um, office functions within that existing historic pump house. Average unit, uh, residential unit is around 600 um, square feet again. So trying to trying to um, convince Winnipeggers that we can live with less and a uh, decent density per um, acre uh, when it really comes down to it. And so the story of the building again is that this was the pumping station that was uh, that was built after the great Chicago fire in Winnipeg, tried to protect the city, pump uh, river water, be able to use that in the case of fire. Fortunately, never had to be used. But then the building uh, was decommissioned and sat empty for for some decades. Um, there were several attempts to uh, try to get that off the ground, uh, meaning that many people were trying to make sense of the scenario. The city was or the city um, uh, arm's length um, organization center venture was um, basically giving it away for a, for a dollar. But the cost burden of having to somehow develop um, the existing building and not having uh, perhaps enough land around it to make sense of other developments was really what was impeding um, it from going forward. And is it was about to get demolished until until we, you know, uh, got on this on the scene and thought, well, we gotta take one more kick at the can. And this is again going back to this critical opportunism um, to bring the right developer to the site to hook them up with Center Venture, who was trying to make sense of the building and, and um, instigate development of it. And then even in the end, uh, bringing some uh, long-term tenants um, to their attention and, and making that marriage happen. But in any case, uh, the key discovery that uh, we had early on in the project was that um, there were cantry cranes uh, in the building already uh, meant to service and, and move the existing pumps uh, within the building. And there was a high capacity structurally there. So we didn't actually need to build a new foundation to be able to support an additional floor within the pumping station. And this was key to be able to make development feasible. And, and what it consists of otherwise is that there is a sort of a 40 foot piece of land in front of the, um, in front of the building and uh, towards Waterfront Drive, which is along the Red River, and then another 100 foot parcel behind. And a lot of, uh, and, and then, sorry, um, the idea that you could actually make uh, rentable, sellable square footage within uh, the existing building. Because the pumps, again, had to be preserved and they couldn't be removed from the building. And so being able to flung a floor above them 
was really key to the uh, scenario of making it feasible. And so the West building is about 52,000 um, square feet. Uh, it's got two blocks of residential. The East building, again, this has nobody had a plan to use this. It was deemed to be too narrow for development. Um, another uh, almost 20,000 square feet of, of building there. And then the pump house itself, uh, about 15 and a half thousand square feet for um, commercial space within it with the new floor construction. And so that sort of essentially made the project go and uh, we were able to, um, we were able to um, uh, create something um, that finan financially made sense. Um, and you can see how the, uh, how the access works. So um, that's the whole uh, great pump hall entry. You can visit that. Um, and then the residential entry is a sort of wrapping around the building and then uh, taking you up the elevator to a, um, to a residential entry there. And then the second, the back building, um, do ways to access the residential elevator core. And then um, again, very sort of, Simply organized uh, rudimentary buildings, uh, three sim very um, identical blocks uh, with seven units across um, on those residential blocks. Uh, wood construction uh, in the residential portion and then um, lightweight and, and structural steel within the, within the um, pumping station itself. It's a complex project and it's oftentimes we try to explain that with sort of these blow up uh, diagrams. Uh, so the new floor is, uh, is flung between the existing uh, historic walls. Uh, you, as a visitor, you're able to experience the pumps, which was an important part of the history. They're actually the same maker as uh, Titanic Motors, uh, it turns out. And then, um, and then this idea that, um, the exiting is actually rather more leisurely within the uh, within the building itself, uh, within the residential building itself. That instead of becoming just a utility, um, it's um, it's more of an experience. And here um, I'll let this run for a short while, but you can see the experience of the of the commercial space within. So there was an ad agency that moved into here, and. Um, the material palette is really trying to respect the industrial past um, and the, the previous life of the building, consisting of just standard off the shelf, um, lightweight steel studs um, and uh, painted, painted black and then uh, glass, uh, not even, if I recall correctly, not even tempered glass because we have a two foot, uh, two foot spacing between the studs so that that was possible. And then uh, opening up some skylights within uh, within that space to create more light uh, within there. And so really, again, very rudimentary uh, material palette um, and um, the idea that you can just, um, oops, okay, sorry. Now we're going into the residential portion here already. So you can see some of those, um, some of those passageways that lead you up. And of course, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, if you've lived in the sixth floor, you can obviously take the elevator, but sort of a connected, um, connected experience. And then uh, instead of guardrails, there's a perforated steel um, or corrugated perforated steel uh, cladding around uh, most of it, creating a bit of uh, uh, valence and, and shade in there. I'm just going to move on. So again, this idea that there's a, there's off the shelf materials that are used perhaps in more innovative ways, uh, back to back um, steel decking uh, to allow some airflow within the floor, uh, sort of a poor man's radiant floor. And um, I trying to remember, but I think the interior was, was done uh, for something like 35 bucks a square foot. So it's, it's pretty, um, and and of course the developer had something to do with that, but um, it's pretty sort of simple and um, feasible system um, there financially. And then the back building um, again showing uh, utilizing the concrete uh, um, floor or ceiling of the parkade, I should say, um, for some bleacher area, and um, and then stacking that seven units across uh, prefabricated almost tube-like 
uh, shotgun units uh, within there. And then we're utilizing a skip stop corridor um, uh, within here, which means that we can save a bunch of circulation, really important, especially on the on the first building where, um, where we're single loaded to be able to fit that 40 foot uh, space and then be able to access uh, either at, at sort of level into the suite or going up the stairs to the second level. So simple units, but cross ventilation completely possible um, because of that. And even on the, on the back part where we have two blocks, that's exterior um, passageway between them. And so again, cross ventilation is possible from uh, from one uh, side of the building to the other, adding sort of quality that we don't often see in the tight developer formula as discussed before, where double, double loaded corridor deep units is usually the norm. Um, and then the suites themselves are uh, nail laminated uh, timber uh, floor. The ceiling uh, is exposed in the suites, so you can see that there. And um, And sort of again, off the shelf industrial materials, but really slow slope on the or low slope on the on the exterior passageways, as you can see here. And light permutation uh, all the way through um, those passageways again skip a, skip a level um, on on and so you can see the two story passageway here. Okay. Um, so as already discussed, some of these some of these tricks of the trade here that again add efficiency, save money, uh, uh, create two different types of suite types uh, from people to to fit various uh, building scenarios. Okay, I think I will at least cover this one more. Um, and so we have uh, the parkade of the future. We've included in the book, even though it's not particularly housing. But what's important about it is that there is future opportunity for the project to turn into housing, be adaptable. And I think, you know, buildings where we can at all think about that future when we build them is something that we should all be doing um, in this day and age with the with the environmental crisis that we have on our hands at the same time. So uh, learning, I guess, something from the uh, um, from the 62M, as you'll see shortly, uh, we'll discuss the housing part of this. Just quickly, um, the project as given to us was um, was on a long site in Calgary uh, along 9th Avenue. Um, there was two sites essentially that they identified um, on both sides of an LRT line that we weren't able to build on. Um, and then, so two development pads and, and we were to fit a uh, 510 stall garage uh, that can be converted in the future to other uses onto, onto one side and leave the other one as, other one as a sort of a development pad for the future. Um, and uh, again, I think the discovery early on was that what if we can actually bridge that, uh, bridge that middle part, we can gain more site area and realize more value for the end user, for the, for the client in this case, and uh, position those future development pads on each end of it. But this way we could actually bridge, um, bridge that land. And um, at the same time, uh, the idea was that if you're going to use a parkade for some other purpose in the future, it needs to have a higher floor to ceiling than a typical parkade would. So this is a four meter floor to ceiling um, height typically. And then um, and then uh, obviously the structural capacity of it had to be something that could support various uses in the future. And um, so more um, loading on the a little bit of upcharge uh, in the beginning to be able to convert that. And then finally, it's a, it's a single slope, 1% um, uh, slope around the whole building, a courtyard in the middle so that it's not too deep uh, to be converted to other uses so that we have plenty of access to light. Um, and that 1% slope um, is something that can be managed as a, as a hallway and be uh, dealt with a topping within the suite, uh, for example. And then in an and sort of industrial uh, use doesn't require other um, other tricks. 
So here we have also an innovation center that was part of the program um, or became part of the program halfway through 55,000 square feet of um, essentially office space uh, within the second floor, uh, trying to figure out how to get people up there through a, um, um, through a ramp. That was the only thing that would have to be disposed in the future, would be wasted in the future if, if the site was converted to other uses. And so again, uh, compared to a traditional parkade, uh, where there's sort of half ramps uh, on, on both ends of the building at the minimum. Um, that wouldn't be the case with this, but most of the floor plate was just simply convertible from the top down. Um, and then uh, we looked at, you know, already planned how the suites could uh, be located uh, within this. And so hopefully as the even the client recognized that it was the last parkade that uh, the Calgary Parking Authority ever wanted to build, um, because car uh, ownership and, and usership is actually going down for the first time since the invention of car. So quite smart of them to think about that um, the way that we should be building is to is to consider those future opportunities. So the full sort of conversion of a floor plate here with exterior uh, or interior passageway around um, uh, around the indoor um, or inner uh, perimeter here and then conversion into, into housing in the future. We also were able to um, locate, or really worked hard, I should say, to locate all the utilities away from uh, view, and then the shroud um, sort of custom uh, pieces, um, but really low cost custom pieces to, um, to create a sort of a um, sinuous form. And then um, what was interesting and after soon after the project was completed is that we had a whole bunch of car guys, car enthusiasts um, taking pictures. So it shows up quite often on Instagram. So sort, of, sort of pretty kind of rewarding experience, but really just wanted to share it from the perspective of the um, um, future convertibility. Um, I do have one more project here. I don't know that I have time for it. We want to leave enough time for discussion. Um, I will just, you know, mention that again, courtyards, plazas, roofs, passages, exit stairs, lifting, um, lifting up, minimizing parking, um, skip stop corridors, all of those things are utilized in this project. Short-term flexibility, unit flexibility, meaning that the developer can um, change their mind halfway through, and we have a scenario that can um, that can handle it. Um, again, uh, this consists of a um, historic building, four-story building that's on site, and a three uh, one-story. Um, there was a one-story uh, industrial building, cinder block building on the site, and that is now sort of wrapped into uh, um, into new housing, seven stories, um, and um, kind of treating the um, treating the um, historic building as a, a as a jewel in the middle. The ground floor consists of some commercial space, uh, townhouse home types of entrances around the courtyard, and then really uh, focusing on leaving some of those passages for to the benefit of the city and building, um, building, um, you know, intimate uh, outdoor rooms as part of the network within the, within the city. Uh, shaping the roof so that maximum sunlight gets in, uh, trying to create a datum across the um, existing historic building and lowering the, lowering the facade at those locations, creating these um, muses and, and pathways through the building and then having sort of a mass that hovers over a fairly permeable ground floor. And so again, the to the to the left of the screen is the uh, is more of the residential uses, and to the to the right, the commercial spaces and the historic building also converted into into suites. So two hundred six suites uh, in this project, quite large. Um, uh, for Winnipeg standards anyway, and lots of entrances and uh, at, at grade, uh, really putting eyes on the on the space. And only 30 uh, parking stalls relying on um, on co-op cars and um, and street parking as a means to create a sort of a greener future. He has some views of the the historic building that the developers were quite eager to preserve. Um, and then the idea that um, 
those suites are really treated with the sort of a small insertion of a utility box in the middle that houses the kitchen and the bathrooms and everything else can be left rather raw. There's an idea of sharing exit stairs here that again adds to the formula on which you can carve space for other features. Um, so this saves money. It's it's in between the historic and the existing, uh, sorry, historic and the new building. Um, we really didn't have a space to put the um, exits there within the historic building and now it serves sort of a dual purpose. So um, a lot of saving on the tear as a result of that. Um, and then you can see the commercial versus the residential and the permeability through the site. Uh, we have um, sort of different configuration with suites at the top where it tapers up. And then we have the courtyard in the center, uh, uh, creating a place for kids to uh, play hopefully and, and um, you know, residents to hang out. And at the rooftop, uh, we also have a rooftop terrace. Um, um, adding sort of more livability and quality to the to the end user. Uh, the short term flexibility here talked, um, as I mentioned, is is premised on the fact that uh, the structural lines run through. Uh, we are able to, we were able to change uh, one bedrooms to two bedrooms throughout the design process so that um, the developer who was from out of town wasn't really familiar what the best scenario was for them uh, in terms of the unit mix so that they could change that. And so three one bedrooms equal to two bedrooms. And this was again, flexible to the very, very end of even doing construction documents. I think we're still mixing this around and uh, custom assembly, a break shape, um, break shapes, uh, really simple metal, about eight uh, inches deep, uh, creating a um, real um, shadow line on the facade and taking its cue from a historic brick on how it meets the corner um, is the idea here, um, how they sort of interlock in the corners um, is sort of uh, an homage to the, uh, the historic brick uh, next door and really just um, place this on top of uh, Vapro Shield for UV. Uh, protection of the, or outsolation, I should say, um, below. So these are some of the construction images just coming to occupancy. And um, again, um, hoping that we can highlight some of those, uh, some of that toolkit further as we're as we're discussing this with the panel. I'm going to leave it at that. Um, again, just um, hoping that uh, we as a profession start to pay attention to that bottom. Uh, twenty five percent, realizing that housing is not a commodity, but rather a human right, and um, that we do everything that with is within our power to create better outcomes for those who need um, um, shelter. Thank you, Johanna. Thank you. Uh, that was uh, excellent presentation. I have to go back to when I asked you to. Uh... Um, if you would be willing to do a NORED, and I remember that, uh, you know, the, the title that you gave us was uh, Practice Ecosystem. Uh, I, I understand Practice Ecosystem a lot better uh, right now, and I, and I wish that that slide that you had up, um, um, every architect that's uh, on the line would uh, really analyze that and uh, adopt that as part of their practice, because there's, there's a lot in that single slide that you put up, which uh, is quite admirable that uh, you, you've developed. And whether you make money or not doesn't really matter, um, but there, there are things in that slide that are incredibly important. And the toolkit, uh, congratulations on the book. Um, I know it's going to be launched soon, and uh, it's something that uh, I think everyone uh, really needs to um, uh, delve into, and uh, it's something that's uh, very much needed. With that, I have um, three uh, panelists that um, uh, are, are, are on the panel today, and I'd like to introduce each of them. And uh, as I introduce them, if you could uh, turn on your cameras and uh, uh, come on. And I'd like to start off with um, Reed uh, Froloff, uh, who is the Dean of College of Architecture at Illinois Institute of Technology in Chicago, a leader in the fields of architecture, urbanism, and design. Uh, Mr. Kroloff is co-founded Jones Kroloff, a practice that develops design strategy and guides architect selection processes. The recipient of the American Academy in Rome's 2003 Rome Prize Fellowship, Reed Kroloff, 
also serves as editor in chief of Architecture Magazine. Additionally, Kroloff directed the Cranbrook Academy of Art and Architecture um, Museum in Bloomfield Hills, Michigan, and was Dean of the Tulane University School of Architecture in New Orleans, which he led through Hurricane Katrina and its recovery. He holds degrees from the University of Texas at Austin and Yale University. He has served on numerous boards and advisory councils, ranging from the Chicago Architecture Foundation to the Register of Peer Professionals of the United States General Services Administration. Welcome, Dean Kroloff. Delighted to be here. The uh, next panelist is uh, Jay Sung Chan, who is the chair of the environmental design program at the Faculty of Architecture at the University of Manitoba in Canada. He studied architectural engineer at Yonsei University in Seoul, Korea, before earning a professional degree in architecture at the University of Manitoba. He also completed post-professional studies on affordable housing at McGill University. Jay Sung's teaching and research interests focus on housing and urban design with particular emphasis on the postman condition and urban interiority. He has received several awards. Recently, his latest project, Open City Design Institute, was invited in the Future School Program of the Korean Pavilion at the 2021 Venice Architectural Biennale. He has also organized the International Symposium on Housing, How Do We Live Together Again 2022, The Next School 2020. As an executive editor, he produced and edited Next Home Soul, a book on design proposals and articles on the topic of next living, December 2017. And Husa's uh, 25 Contemporary Housing Speculations by Students Around the World, August 2017. Welcome, Jay Sung Chan. Glad to be here. Thank you. Our third panelist is Trevor Bodie, who is a critic, curator of contemporary architecture and Vancouver-based urban designer. His most recent book, City Builder, The Architecture of James M. Chung, Images Melbourne. And his book, Architecture of Douglas Cardinal, was awarded the Alberta Book of the Year Award. And his writings on buildings and cities has garnered Canadian international awards, including the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada Advocacy Award, the Jack Webster Journalism Award, and the UIA CICA Pierre Vago Prize for Best Architectural Criticism Worldwide with texts published in English, Spanish, Portuguese, and Japanese. As curator, Bodhi created the 2014 Rethink Behind San Diego Skyline for Boza and the Vancouverism Architecture Builds the City exhibition for the 2008 London Festival of Architecture remounted in 2009 in Paris, then in Vancouver for 2010 Olympics. He has a master's in architecture from the University of Calgary. He has held academic positions at UBC, Oregon, uh, Manitoba, Carleton, and Toronto, and lectures globally on contemporary design. Trevor is a fellow of the New York Institute of Urban Design and of the RAIC. Welcome, Trevor Bodie. Uh, thank you, Silvio. And you in Toronto will have to turn on my video. I can't do it here. Uh, Elena, can you help us? With there that? we go. Okay, thank uh, you very much. Perfect. We're all here now. Good. So I'm going to start off with um, Dean Kroloff with um, opening comments about uh, the uh, 
Johanna's uh, presentation today. Uh, Dean Kroloff, you'll yep. have to turn. Yep, got it. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> um, I'm delighted to be here and I have to apologize a little bit. Um, I work in one of the great master masterpieces of 20th century architecture, Crown Hall. Um, and uh, you saw a picture of it, thanks to Johanna uh, and uh, and Silvio in the beginning. Um, but it's a glass building and it's uh, largely daylit and we are having a Chicago day today, so it's a little dark. Um, so I've got a, I've borrowed a, a shop lamp to try and give myself a little more daylight here. So I apologize about that if there's a slightly evil cast um, from below to this. Um, and then I also um, want to thank uh, Nora for doing this. Um, this is my second go round, and I just think it's a terrific program that you all do here. Um, and I love the fact that there's 110 people or thereabouts uh, on this call right now. And and so I want to say welcome to everybody who's um, uh, with us via Zoom and good good for you for joining in the middle of a work day on something like this. That's fantastic. We actually, um, hit, we actually hit about 128 at the uh, right in the middle of uh, Johanna's presentation. <laughs> yeah, well, then they read that I was coming, and that's what dropped the numbers <laughs> that, right after that. that. So, <laughs> yeah, it was like, you know, so, but the the rest of the diehards, well, we uh, we appreciate them being here. Um, I just want to say a few things so that we can have longer time for conversation. Um, first of all, uh, IIT was delighted to be a part of uh, the 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 birth of the book that's coming, um, and uh, through Johannes. Um, presence in the school as a as a Morgan Stern fellow. Um, and um, it, uh, it, it's, I wasn't here yet, so I, I can claim no um, personal uh, part of that. But um, it, it people here still talk about the symposium that went on um, and the, the sparkling dialogue around it, which I think you saw a little bit of it today um, of what caused that in the the remarkable organization of the book. Um, and um, I think saying book is not exactly fair um, because this is a four volume uh, series and each of those books is about this thick. Um, it's a really comp one of the first important comprehensive looks at the issue of housing um, in a very long time that I believe has real meaning. The last time I think someone took this on in any uh, substantial way was um, in the uh, the period of time when the new urbanists really had at the question of how do you approach um, housing. Uh, and I'm no fan of new urbanism, um, but I'm a tremendous fan of their uh, systematic de deconstruction of uh, assumptions about how one goes about housing. What's terrific in this um, approach is now we finally have in that same kind of analytical framework, real architecture happening, um, which the new urbanists just didn't ever figure out how to do. And um, Johanna's work, uh, not just Johanna's, the, the firm's work um, really approaches that from a fresh perspective. Um, and one that I think uh, challenges a, a lot of us it's been a long time since someone did a round building and said, look, you can make this work in commercial housing. Um, we have a pretty famous set of examples here in Chicago, um, and they were provocative when they were built. They're provocative now. Um, and uh, and I think that uh, the work of the firm um, carries that so much further forward. Um, and uh, so whether it's a formal issue or whether it's an analytical um, issue, um, whether it's a, 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 an approach, an intellectual approach, uh, such as the one that we were um, just looking at a, a little while ago when Jonna was uh, listing the 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 the, uh, the four parameters of analysis um, that that underlie much of the work in the book, this is a toothy, substantive review of how housing can work, and it raises a lot of questions. And what I had hoped to do today in my remaining two minutes was just to mention a couple of those, just a few of the kinds of questions that it that, that it uh, raises for me and a couple of uh, um, a couple of the ideas, I think, one of which I'll start with first, a uh, or not a question, but a, a, a statement, which is 
this book simply proves that architects can no longer and sit no longer sit quietly on the sidelines and say we really don't know how to engender the conversation that needs to go on okay you don't that's fine they did right the converse consider the conversation engendered now and let's have it um secondly this book um does something that's vital for architects and architects I think know this in their heart of hearts, but sometimes get caught up in their own systems too much to step outside, which is to demonstrate critical expertise. It's very, very simple. In this case, that critical expertise happens to do be analytical and that analysis uh, ranges across subject matter, whether it's finance or structures or materials, they're all present in the book, uh, books, um, and they're present in a way that demonstrates that expertise quite clearly. Uh, and that's something that I think architects just have to do if they're going to have any role in this conversation um, moving forward, all of which goes to the question of architectural agency. What is the agency of an architectural firm? And, and I think this book makes a very, very powerful argument that architects do in fact have agency. They can get out from underneath the kind of shadow that's been dogging them since 1960, whatever, when they tore down pruitt Igo, that architects only in multiple housing only produce nightmares. Um, and that it's just not true. Um, and so um, this is, I think, one of the most persuasive sets of arguments rather than an argument, persuasive sets of arguments that I've seen um, in, in, in a long time uh, that can help us overcome that. Having said all that, I will turn it over to one of my colleagues who's ever next, Silvio. Now, Silvio, it's your turn to come off of muting. Thank you, I should know better. <laughs> Jay Sung, I think that you're, you're up next. Yes, um, this is incredible because um, every time we hear from Joanna, I've known uh, Joanna and Sasha and Colin, uh, most of their practice members uh, since their student years and, and now sort of colleagues, and we worked on certain projects together. But every time I hear from uh, them or one of their representatives or Johanna, Sasha or Colin, uh, it's so refreshing and so refreshing, so refreshing to hear the updates and hear the rigor that they maintain. So um, it was so refreshing to hear their sort of next chapter that they're opening up with this book. I think the book that is coming up is like opening up a new chapter for all of us. But uh, I would I would pick up on uh, call of uh, Dean Kolov's uh, so notion of agency. I think it's the bring uh, the book uh, the publication brings the agency back to architecture, and and all of us are sort of enabled or, or empowered in a way to move forward. I think that's the, what's the what the book is about, and uh, it's so refreshing to hear from Johanna on that note today as well. Now, I think I wanted to point out uh, three things that I, I think uh, just uh, as I was hearing and reflecting on our sort of um, experience with together, you know, there's such an incredible amount of generosity coming from 546 a uh, all the members, I think it's uh, spearheaded by Johanna and Sasha and Colin, of course. But the generosity really is speaking in throughout the whole book. And also the uh, when you say ecosystem, you know, you basically captured the generosity as part of your practice in a way. So by calling it an ecosystem. So, you know, losing your shirt is really beyond and above the script. Losing your shirt project is beyond and above a contract, a commission. But you're you're capturing that as part of the practice through your generous understanding of this as part of the uh, parcel. I think that's sort of a refreshing way to understand how you work and how we might think about this sort of operational uh, mode, right? So I think, thank you for offering that sort of notion and also continuing to do so through your generous uh, sort of approach in, in everything. And uh, it's sort of also refreshing to hear architecture explained from the common ground level, like the the spaces in between, and 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 the kind of the urban fabric, rather than the other side, which is esoteric forms and 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 ideas behind an abstraction, which 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 sort of has its place, and and it's, I think it's coming through different ways. But the order of explain explanation that you had in your presentation in your book is really from the from the common ground 
the, where the numbers are taken care of, the performer is taken care of, and w- the material starts to strategically in, insert itself and structure comes uh, forward in the kind of little wiggle room that you identify as an architectural opportunity, but impactfully situated. So I think those start, those becomes very refreshing uh, remarks that you're making. And third point that I wanted to point out in, in, in relation to talk, also in relation to larger discussion of affordable housing, is a sense of ownership, that's the idea of ownership. Um, I, I personally believe the housing has a the housing crisis related to uh, the 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 model of ownership that we have in the housing market, and you touched on this uh, in in your presentation, and because of the ownership has to shift. I think you talked about four percent owner uh, sort of co housing model and a, co- a public housing model, thirty two percent in in European context. I think that has to shift, and then there's there's a couple of sort of lingering question in my mind, if that actually shifted to public housing. Uh, the economy of the whole performa changes, right? And then, and then, I wonder how that might sort of translate into the kind of the designer's world in your sort of performa. If the public housing economy starts to kick in as a model, if it did, and hope hope, hope it does, uh, then the 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 uh, the performa, the figures, the number game will slightly shift, right? So, or does it? Or do, do we do we maintain the learnings from the market uh, place? And then uh, practice in a strategic way in the public public housing market is something that we can think about as a question mark. But uh, kind of associated with that, one more question uh, you touched on briefly. Uh, you wanted to advocate uh, that we can live with less. I think housing is ultimately, in the end, uh, a lifestyle. So, so, so now you're. I'm, I'm wondering if you can sort of illustrate that at at the end. Uh, what kind of lifestyle are you? advocating for us, you know, through your build uh, your housing projects. I think that would be wonderful to just hear from your side. Thank you. The uh, opening comments from uh, Trevor. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, great to be in this company. Um, I'd like to kick around the idea of missing middle for a minute, because uh, I think it's quite important to this discussion. Um, one thing really hit me about halfway through Johanna's uh, presentation is that her presentation could proceed from the completely opposite direction. Uh, There could be an equally successful talk that would start with the work and then go through the diagrams and analysis. And I do think that design is a two-way street uh, and that uh, we as critics, Reed and I, uh, we usually start with the building built open almost, walk through it, Sometimes we get diagrams as brilliant as these. More often we don't. Usually what we do with our prose and our thinking and slideshows is try to adduce the principles and ideas embedded in work. Uh, The wonderful thing about this book is we have a, a collection of powerful principles and ideas. It's not a cookbook. Um, I am started my teaching career in, in at UBC in Oregon. I had my gullet filled with uh, Chris Alexander's uh, <laughs> cookbook, uh, Pattern Language. Uh, you know, uh, I, I remember my students would say it's a 143 with a 72, and I was supposed to know what that meant in Oregon. Uh, it's not that, but it's very interesting because the four books go from micro to macro, from abstract principles to constructed flesh reality. And I think that's so exciting. And, and in fact, I now regret that the books are numbered because it kind of privileges a, a reading. You could start with the building. Well, okay. You could start with the, with the last and work back. Um, so I think what uh, the set of books has done is for architects provided a conceptual missing middle. The missing middle between the first site visit and the and the brief from the client and the finished building open to the public. Uh, what happens between that? What, what happens from first encounter with a commission and a site and, and then a completion of the design? Well, there's a lot of processes that happen. The fabulous thing about this collection is it really helps with that conceptual missing middle of architectural design. In others, when you're looking around for options, for circulation, for, for ways 
uh, uh, that wings can meet, et cetera. There's so much here um, and, and really, really useful. And none, none of it uh, declared it, uh, not saying do this, not that. There, it is open, uh, so open, this book, in its philosophy and its generosity uh, to different housing forms and so on. So um, uh, I have long resisted that journalistic phrase, missing middle. I think that contemporary planning is too much driven by journalism. And that this really starts to some degree with Lewis Mumford, but really with Jane Jacobs. Um, everybody bats off eyes on the street and other things. Uh, today, Jan Gale probably functions in the same way, um, you know, kind of uh, little phrases, cash phrases, memes that are, are supposed to drive uh, design. Um, this is different. Um, uh, this is providing a, a much, much needed missing middle for for the the day after the site visit and the two years before the submission of the final drawings. And I think that is the terrain where most architects live. And I do think uh, Johanna and her team and her, her colleagues have over delivered on uh, exploring a terrain that's so underexamined in architecture, um, uh, and thank you for it. Johanna, you, you have your hands full. So I'll, I'll leave it up to you to uh, uh, to respond to any of the three panelists in, in whatever order you like. Well, okay, thank you. Um, it is it is such a pleasure and privilege again to have these um, these smart folks here to provide commentary and and have a discussion and uh, truly appreciate the the opportunity and everyone's time. Um, well, let's start with uh, I, I think you know Trevor brought an interesting um, point about the sort of like and I think we talked about that a little bit too, but this sort of uh, organization. I mean, we certainly struggled with um, trying to put out something that wasn't 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 meant to be about the projects, but was meant to be about uh, the lessons in them. And, you know, as as he, you know, Trevor sat through with us a couple of reviews in, you know, which order you put things, how do you not lose the narrative, but be able to sort of tell the parts that you want to tell. And that's been a real struggle. But um, in the end, what we ended up, so I just want to clarify, is four volumes, but the idea is that they're in a single slipcase, and you can you can you can use them whichever way you want. Um, so it might be confusing. We don't know. <laughs> Proof will be in the pudding once we hear when people have have them on their desk. And the idea is that you can open up the reference catalog and then refer back to the lessons that are that are in the book. Um, and at the same time, we didn't have a chance to talk a lot about the the first one, which was really the symposium at the IIT, and and the hope that that one is going to be an ongoing discussion and something that's not finished. And uh, while we have to talk about the issues surrounding housing, when it comes to zoning, when it comes to policy that's around today, those things, of course, are changing every day. Uh, even just yesterday, the Canadian government is announcing that uh, they're going to drop GST from all of the uh, new rental um, um, rental apartment construction. And that's going to be huge news for vast majority of our our clientele and and will change the sort of um, atmosphere uh, on what we are able to do and so on. So hopefully it's an uh, it's a continuing uh, continuum uh, a discussion. It's not a not a thing that's finished and hopefully it can be added on. So maybe we'll create more volumes as we go um, forward in the future. Again, appreciate all the kind words and and um, um, you know your belief that something valuable will come out of that. I wanted to also address Jay's uh, questions about the um, uh, living with less and and do the numbers change if if we manage to get more housing in the public, uh, you know, public hands. And I I I do think that there are lessons, of course, that carry forward that the waste should never be the option. Um, it should still be robust and 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 based on sort of what the true needs are. Um, and we shouldn't be frivolous about what, whatever the money is coming from, obviously where the resources are coming from. But at the same time, I think there would be, there would be sort of uh, a, a new discussion about what it means to build something that will endure, um, what the quality will be in the end. 
um, how we can perhaps, uh, to answer your other questions, use other spaces within the scenario, not just the rentable, sellable square footage for the benefit of the end user, but how does outdoor space become um, part of the the new reality? Um, can it be shared in even in the North American sort of mindset? Um, I hope uh, it can. Uh, Jay anyway has heard me a lot talk about this in the past where we, you know, grew up in spaces where we share outdoor space and those are my, you know, best memories as a, as a child. Those are where, you know, um, lifelong friendships were formed and so forth. And, um, you know, that is what we think is missing uh, in the North American scenario, what holds us back from being able to duplicate um, the multifamily housing um, as as a sort of a acceptable form of living for broader public, um, because we don't have those spaces, because we don't build them into our uh, formulas, because there's no one who wants to necessarily pay for them. So we almost as architects have to sneak those in uh, to be able to um, uh, to get them on sites and and a few few instances you can see where we've you know succeeded in doing so um and then um i don't know somebody asked in the uh asked in the uh, um chat there how pandemic will affect the future and um i guess i do have a couple of thoughts about that uh one would be definitely this focus on outdoor space um and then one would be sort of very much an interior you know, how, how, how does space become flexible enough that you can manage work? And I mean, that's nothing new, but you can manage work and, um, and living in the same place. Uh, you know, we, we carve out more sort of flex space within the suite that, you know, allows you to, um, to create the life that you do you want. And we've done some of that in, even in the, um, deeply affordable units that we're currently working on in, in Calgary, where, um, we have sort of a place that can become, a nursery um short term can become a walk-in closet can become a um home office or an extended storage room or whatnot or or you know so it's, it's up to the to for the user to have some agency even in a in when they're they're really low income to to customize their space but really kind of at rudimentary means again so those would be some of my thoughts around that and i'm you know glad to have more back and forth Um, uh, Johanna, I think you're you're probably underestimating the importance of the IIT symposium. Uh, like Jay, I've known you and your partners a long time. I do think it, it was a, a really a crucial creation. I think inviting the people you did, none of the usual suspects. It was a delight to go through the program, meet people, and see their work, because it was not the hand-me-downs that we usually see published. And a lot of terrific work. And luckily, I got snowed in for an extra day. And Mariana Modio and I got to go out to neighborhoods and toured by some of the speakers. It, it, it was amazing. So I do think the symposium itself uh, provided the fertilizer for this. I don't think it would have happened uh, for other reasons. And, um, and 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 once again, your, your next talk could start with it uh, okay. as laying the ground down upon which uh, the rest of this developed. Uh, Trevor, point, Trevor, I, I would add uh, go to ahead, that. Also, yeah, I'd add to that also, though IIT was delighted to host that symposium. I think what's really important here is to emphasize that it was Johanna that put it all together, right? The, the, it was it may have been the precursor to the book, um, but um, it, that was something that this is part and parcel of of the of the firm's activities and. Um, and I think it's really important for architects, particularly the architects on this call, to take a minute and look closely at, at the woman who's with you here today and the firm that she represents. This is a firm that ha this is not the only kind of work they do, but this is a firm a little bit like another NORAD guest from a few months back. Angie Brooks and Larry Scarpa, two firms, if you look at this one, them and, and Johanna's office, that have active multi-building type practices, but have made a strong intellectual commitment as well as an emotional or a, 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 as a um, an ethical commitment to pursuing 
a, a, a very major problem uh, in our profession and in our world, really more the world, um, which is how do you get at this issue of, of housing and making it affordable for people beyond the top one or two percent, right? Mm -hmm. And um, yes, it gets into questions of how big these units are, what's an, you know what's an ideal size and what's an ideal uh, you know location and you know orientation and all the rest of those sorts of issues. But at the fundamental core is how do we get this done? And this is not the only way. What what I what excites me a lot about this book is they're pointing at things and saying, hey, zoning can help with this or zoning not just can help, but zoning is critical for helping with this. And land use planning is critical for helping with this. And then uh, I wanted to, where's my, the word that you used? Uh, one of your four, uh, one of your four, um, uh, your, op your word, your opportunistic. Um, Opportunism is a word that is used in a very negative way most of the time and should not be. Um, it is something that gives us great chances to explore things that we might not otherwise do. And you, the, the trick is to jump on board. And I think that that's what this firm has done with this work. They've jumped on board. Um, and is this complete? I would guess that Johanna would say no. But it's a major stab um, at starting the conversation, in, moving in a different direction. Sorry, Trevor, to interrupt. Yeah, no, and, and Reed, thank you very much uh, again, and and thanks, Trevor, also for for mentioning that maybe I was coming across a little unappreciative of the symposium. That's certainly not was not my intent. Uh, I think it was more so to um, try and, um, or or maybe I wasn't um, talking about it enough because we've had other presentations where we covered the uh, the symposium contents but you're right it's absolutely was the key um it wouldn't have this this book wouldn't have happened the idea wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for the symposium first and and you know it, it is an interesting read as well the entire package there and and i'm incredibly grateful to the people who came um uh, you know to that that conversation and what they contributed to it and we almost left it at that um we had sort of lessons learned we did a summary uh at the end of that and then what happened is that sort of thought of well goodness like maybe we do have more to say about this topic and and you know four years later i wish it wasn't that long but um finally we also get to see the symposium book um so that's definitely part of it and um will serve as a foundation for the future Future discussions, I hope. Just a comment on on some of the, some of the discussion that's going on. Uh, I think in knowing you and uh, your your uh, team, uh, what's uh, worth noting in uh, for the audience that uh, joining us today is the the critical opportunism that you've discussed. It really uh, trickle downs in any uh, every aspect of your operation. Like you you don't throw anything out really. It, like everything's captured. As an opportunity in your in your in your in your book that's coming up, uh, the things that you went through, the projects and the events that you generate, it becomes a kind of a vehicle to advocate a value that you're sort of asserting through the publication, and every opportunity that you went through becomes a kind of an avenue for the next one. So I think, I think that kind of curatorial mindset is so powerful in the book that is showing, because it's it, if I read the whole, I mean, I had a chance to go through the draft. Uh, it's just you know everything's curated towards the next next move. So I think that that kind of attitude is something that we have we are taking back from your book as as well as your practice reflected on that publication. Um, and your 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 curatorial eye catches on the small small rooms. I think this comes from back to your discussion of performa and stuff. You know, even small room, small number becomes an opportunity for you. I mean, that 62M building is uh, exemplar. I mean, that's dead end, no, nowhere to go kind of law, uh, land becomes an opportunity for new, something new, new through the numbers that you went through. So you invented, curated an opportunity within the kind of a deadlock zone. So I think that attitude is something that we should bring forward in the next operation of architectural practice if we want to regain that agency that we're talking about. So thank you for reminding us that there is that critical opportunism that we can sort of go back to, that picking up, curating small bits as a kind of a powerful tool for us to advocate new values to the market. Thank you.
Um, okay, thank you, panel. I, um, I'm going to bring on uh, George Sorridge. George, if you want to come on camera. Uh, George is um, VP of Residential in the uh, NOR Chicago office. And uh, George is going, has been fielding questions from the audience, and uh, he's going to um, pose some of the questions from the audience. George, please go ahead. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, John. And not, not a whole lot of questions from the audience. Definitely a lot of shout outs from your huge fan club that you have here, uh, Joanna. But, you know, one thing I was thinking about, you know, being someone that, um, that works in similar fields in that multifamily environment, in some ways, I think maybe you're a bit modest saying that you sneak in some of these ideas. It's much more than sneaking it in. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, what, you know, there must be a, a re-education re process of the various industry stakeholders, you know, when it comes to performas, comes to costing models, comes to code interpretation, you know, what what is that process if you have it? And, you know, what are some of the struggles and what have been some of the wins that, that you've had in going through that? Well, I, I think we were incredibly fortunate, as I as I mentioned in the beginning, that we got schooled by some of the private developers that we worked for very early on, and got a hold of. Um, I think it was in two thousand eight, the 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 first kind of developer performance sheet, which outlined, you know, the the cost of borrowing money, the uh, the the real estate fees in the end, and and things like that. So it was sort of very all the soft costs that you 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 didn't learn in school, um, and um, and I think it would be great if we, and that's what we've been trying to do with our studios when we when we do teach them is to try to get students familiar with that um, so that the next generation of architects would be able to be better prepared for the world of the those realities and not get jaded and not get um, disgruntled or, or uh, you know, cynical of what, what the profession can offer. So if we have that in our, in our back pocket, then we can fight the fight more um you know from a more equal uh playing field and uh and typically what what's you know ha has happened to us is that it's that and you're right it's about you know also code interpretations uh colin in particular in office is very well versed in everything that you know how you go around things uh, and this week we're starting a discussion with lga uh on on trying to get around the trying to create an alternative solution for the two exits as well so that's that's something new that we're excited about um and I, and it, of course not to compromise people's life safety that's obviously not the goal but um so if you if you sort of know the givens and if you even understand the facts of what what how many times you have to go up the lift to put cladding up because it's you know whatever that that type of process is and what the sequence of construction is, that will add uh, more value back into the design pocket. Um, so, and if your if your plumbing walls do, do in fact line up, or whatever the case might be, or if you can use your structural um, uh, grid or, or structural bay width to the to the width of the units and then the parking below and whatever, all of that. Uh, has to be accounted for that um, that we can sort of save the cost and spend it elsewhere. That's really the kind of goal, goal is to spend it on the quality in the end. Um, so hopefully that answers some of your questions. For sure, for sure. Um, just wondering as well then, I mean, what have been some of the, the public-private successes that you've had? I mean, oftentimes in our environment, we sort of have mandates of affordability. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot of conflict and tension between the public and private when it comes to that, you know, and we'll often have developers that are looking to, you know, to to, to maybe get some way around that just due to the, the cost of, of those mandates. But I'm just wondering what sort of programs have you encountered or talked with uh, as a way of, you know, making it more of a partnership and collaboration uh, to, to bring affordability in, into the market? Oh, um, other than trying to sort of be innovative when it comes to um, the expenses, I don't know that there's any sort of a magic trick there. Like I said, I think that it, it has a lot to do with whether we have a public client or a private client. I understand completely well and, and that, you know, a private uh, private developer is is they have a business that they're running the business and those numbers have to work. That's the first 
thing. And um, and if there's a government program that allows them to uh, rent a suite at the maximum rent of 1100, well, you can very much guess what the, the rent will be. It's not going to be less than that, right? Um, so I think it does that that does come back to the the policies we create and the and the rules that we set up as a as a public um, from the you know publicly led from the government that you know we have to mandate um, something better in the end whether it's the quality of of sunlight reaching the back of the unit or whether it's whether it's what an affordability really truly means for for majority of Canadians, that's that's and, and Americans, <laughs> so that's I think where the difference lies. Um, we're not going to get it from the private development. And that I hope was uh, my clear point in the beginning is that we somehow think and and there's still an environment that the private industry is somehow going to solve the housing crisis. They're not going to. Um, it has there has to be much more parts to it. They can be a player, they can be a partner, they can produce the stock that we need, but there has to be rules in place that the, the affordability crisis is, is going to get solved. Johanna, I have to disagree with you. Um, yes, the private sector is not going to solve the crisis. However, your firm, your ideas, and this book have things to offer to lots in the private sector. When I was doing a longer version with, with visuals for this and I, I cut it away, I was gonna show two things from Vancouver to show what's not in your book. At one end, it was gonna be Kengo Kuma's uh, luxury high rise, gorgeous new building, beautifully laid out, a really significant piece of architecture and city building, but again, way bigger and grander than anything you do. At the other end, we built 2000 units of modular housing for the homeless all over the city, uh, which have not been well uh, considered or worked out and they're proving hard to move around, et cetera. I do think that the arguments in the book and indeed your own practice could extend both directions, you know, to temporary housing or to refugee housing, disaster housing. There's lots in this book that could go that way. And I think you're underestimating how many of these ideas could be informative of luxury housing. I think it's some of the most lazy designs going, uh, overpriced, uh, <laughs> horrible units, et cetera. And I do think there's, there's stuff in here for that. And I do think your practice will investigate both realms before too long. I just wanted to pick up on that note. Uh, you know, there's lots of learnings that you've uh, confessed to Winnipeg as a kind of a as a ground of learning, and also the kind of the the uh, the 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 means that were not available here that sort of taught you strategies and and a, a sort of curatorial aspect of your practice and so forth and so on. Now, I wonder uh, uh, since you've talk, uh, taught taught uh, as well, and also we have academics here, and also I'm sure the audience there may be some students involved. Uh, would you say, based on your experience of teaching, and also this is a question to uh, our panelists as well, would you say uh, uh, bring a sense of that reality of performer into the teaching side? Would you say that would be uh, more meaningful or the traditional, I mean, the traditional conventional sort of understanding of, okay, practice, you learn that in practice and you teach something else in, in education. Would you say at this point, at this juncture of our culture and society, it'd be much more meaningful to bring those performer numbers as a sense of understanding in the, in the teaching context, would you say, or no? Well, it's a tough balance as, as we've discussed in the past, I think Jay, that, you know, on one hand, of course you want students to learn to think and, and not be bogged down by some of the realities that will face them in the future. But maybe if there's sort of a hybrid that they get to sort of free wheel on one hand and in a, in a different studio, but also the kind of learning on, on the realities of the um, financial end of it um, would be part of sort of a regular curriculum. I think that would be healthy um, so that you would have at least some background because I find that students are often really kind of deers in the headlights uh, when we first introduce this topic and um, but then in the end and they curse it as we go along because it's 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 sort of there's a steep learning curve I, I suppose but once we get to the other end of it then they're often very grateful and thankful that this is sort of something that really prepares them for for reality so I don't know. And and Trevor, that was generous. Thank you. If you think there's a value there, I appreciate that very much. 
I have to add really quickly that ironically, uh, this semester we have a studio being taught by Skidmore Owings and Merrill called Pro Forma Nova. Um, so <laughs> just, just randomly, that's the case. Um, and uh, the idea behind the studio is to depart, the, the studio departs from the Pro Forma out to the project and students bring their own pro forma on every project will be different, but um, takes the pro forma and breaks it apart into its um, understood constituent pieces to see if there are things to be uncovered there and rethought. And um, I'm very excited. I have no idea what's going to happen. It just started three weeks ago, um, but I'm very excited to see what's going to come of it. And by maybe way, way of a closing statement, I think that what you just said, Jay, um, and Trevor too, this is exactly, uh, goes right back to Johanna and what's so exciting about that firm and about the book is again, and something architects need to do. And, and I hope that everyone on this firm, on this call, I mean, um, thinks about it this way. It's breaking apart assumptions and asking us to look at each of them piece by piece to see if they make sense or how they can be reconsidered. And, and it does it with beautiful graphics. It's very, very simply organized um, and, and, and compelling all along the way. Um, and so just pick it up and digest it a little bit, a little bit at a time. Uh, it's a long, slow meal that you'll be very <laughs> pleased that you um, partook in. Uh, Dean Kroloff, that's a great ending to this NORAD. Uh, I want to thank you for being uh, part of this and uh, being part of the, uh, the book, as you say. Um, Jay Sung, thank you for being part of this. Um, uh, your university seems to turn out some uh, pretty uh, incredible people, and some of them actually stay in Winnipeg and uh, do some <laughs> incredible work, as, as we've seen. Uh, in fact, the N in NOR, Bill Nish, uh, was from your, your university, and uh, he hired me, so I turned out okay, I guess. But uh, a pretty incredible university, and uh, keep up the good work. Uh, Trevor, uh, you've been on NORED before. Um, uh, we'll have to get, get you back uh, to do another NORED. Uh, great having you on uh, this panel, and uh, great work. Thank you, George. And Johanna, um, it's not a book. It's, it's four volumes. Um, I've had a scan of it. Uh, I think it's, um, uh, as everybody has said on this panel, it's it's going to be the go-to book in this moment of crisis in affordable housing. And um, whether it's the middle or whether it's the book on housing, I think it's the book on housing. And uh, uh, it's, it's an incredible piece of work. And for anybody that's attempted a book, and I've attempted a few, not at Trevor's level by any means, uh, but I, I understand the effort that goes into it, and it's just it's it's a huge amount of effort. And congratulations on the book. And when is the official uh, launch? Well, there's a launch in Mextropoli, um, so the largest uh, architectural conference in North America, um, taking place on the twenty second to twenty fifth of this month, so this weekend. Uh, so that's our soft launch, but we won't get copies and the bulk of the copies until mid October, I'm told. So okay, so everybody yeah. will be able to be party, at least. everybody will be able to get a copy in October. I hope so. Yeah, thank okay. you. <laughs> Congratulations again, and thank you for doing this. Uh, very much appreciated. All the best to you. Thanks so much, Silvio. Appreciate it. Thanks everybody for coming. Thank you for everyone on uh, Nora Ed, and we'll see you all next time. Bye now. <laughs>